Good morning. Good early Saturday morning. Thank you so much for um, being here with us on an early Saturday morning here in Chicago. Um, and thank you so far uh, just for a wonderful uh, last two days, and we're looking forward to our third and final day here at DML uh, 2013. So um, this morning, our plenary takes a, a slightly different uh, kind of shift, but I think as the conversation evolves this morning, you'll begin to see how it connects to some of the, the conversations that you've been sharing, many of the panels, presentations, even some of the remarks that Ethan shared with us during his keynote. Um, and, and so I just wanted to open up with kind of, kind of posing the question, and, and the plenary uh, panelists here will address it, why popular culture at a conference dealing with youth, civic, social, and political engagement? And if, for those of you who are familiar with, with, with DML and the initiative, about two years ago um, in the conference at, in Long Beach, uh, California, there was a, a kind of a statement and a recognition that one of the pathways to really engaging young people, understanding young people, connecting in very powerful and meaningful ways with young people is through popular culture. And so in the aftermath of that meeting, uh, there have been a variety of different uh, efforts and initiatives within DML and certainly beyond that have be begun to really think about and take seriously the potential of popular culture as a lever of engagement, as an opportunity to engage young people, and really as a space to understand and, 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 and really make uh, new possible worlds with young people uh, available. So if you think about what's been happening just here in Chicago as, as one example with, with U Media, uh, for instance, um, and the ways in which uh, hip hop and spoken word have been leveraged as a way of uh, allowing young people or helping young people find their voice, articulate their views, their narratives, and creating kind of both a performative space, but also for them a very meaningful space in terms of how they understand their relationship to the broader world, the broader world around them. Also through U Media, as students given the opp opportunity to kind of marshal their energies and their, their, their passions and their enthusiasm uh, into, for example, a creating a music label and all of the kinds of opportunities that that kind of opened up for students and even some of the work that they've been doing recently around fashion uh, are also ways in which popular culture becomes a pathway to some of the kinds of opportunities and literacies that we think so much about here at DML. Um, U Media has also been involved in works and projects that have introduced them to and, and put them on stage with the likes of John Legend. Um, many of you may be familiar with the work that the foundation, that the MacArthur Foundation has been doing with Lady Gaga's Born This Way, and also again thinking about the manner in which pop culture can be used as a, as a way to connect with, as a way to broaden the message, as a way to bring more and more people uh, into the tent and into the community. And certainly, if you think about just the ways in which uh, DML and other researchers have began to sort of reimagine what games mean in the lives of young people and the functions and the role of play and how play is a very powerful uh, opportunity for young people to explore, to experiment, uh, and to create. And so in that sense, um, think about just the rich world of, of, of games and, and how dynamic that space can be. And so all of this is really interesting, right, because the, the, the sort of popular opinion of popular culture is that it's, it's antisocial, that it's commercial, um, that it in many ways is trivial. Uh, and, and, and I think so much of what, what the work that you'll hear about here uh, today suggests, right, is, is, is the complete opposite. Uh, and today, we be, we, as you begin to think about young people's participation in the digital world, young people's engagement with social media, young people's engagement with games, young people's engagement with social network sites, uh, and how those function, right, as sources of popular culture, leisure, recreation, but as the work of Mimi Ito and others has demonstrated, these are also important spaces where young people begin to navigate and sort of negotiate issues around privacy, around citizenship, around what it means to be in this world, what it means to be a part of a peer community, what it means to be um, uh, a person in many respects. And so in that regard, um, you know, we begin to think about pop culture as a possibility space. Uh, and Henry Jenkins, for example, in his work has talked so much about pop culture as a participatory space as well, and what that means in terms of providing uh, these opportunities for young people to explore their world in really meaningful and important kinds of ways. And so for me, a lot of this work has been inspired by um, the emergence of cultural studies about 30 or 40 years ago, and particularly a lot of the, the work that, that, that came out of uh, London. And I'm thinking of people like Stuart Hall, Angela McRobbie, Dick Hebditch, who really began to, to, to look at popular culture with, with a new set of lens and begin to see popular culture, right, as in, in their words, as a space for kind of cultural, ideological, and even political struggle. 
If you think about where our, our narratives and our common sense ideas about the world around us, about race, about gender, about sexuality, a lot of these things are played out through the theater of popular culture. And these are the kinds of things that young people are constantly kind of navigating, the ways in which they accumulate, acquire, and negotiate for symbolic and even cultural capital in their lives. And so it's through popular culture that we begin to understand the ways in which young people sort of struggle for power, for authority, for, or, or against authority, the way in which they struggle for mobility. Uh, and so in this sense, um, you know, we see popular culture um, as, as a way through which young people begin to develop the scripts, the models, and again, the narratives for how they begin to navigate uh, different regimes of authority in their lives. If it's parents, if it's adults, if it's schools, it's oftentimes this sort of interesting kind of navigation, this kind of struggle around popular culture, what young people are drawn to, what they're attracted to, and how that historically we've thought about it as a source of tension, as a source of contradiction, um, but in many respects, I think the work that you'll see here uh, and hear about here is how we begin to think about popular culture in new uh, and important uh, kinds of ways. And so I'm, you know, and so much of what we've come to understand about young people's migration to the digital world, if it's through their use of, uh, if it was MySpace, if it was Facebook, think about the things that young people are doing now with Instagram, with Tumblr, with Twitter, creating YouTube channels. Again, a lot of this is how they begin to articulate their own relationship to, the, to popular culture, but I think more importantly, to the world around them. And so in this sense, we take this world quite seriously. We look, at the, we look at the world of popular culture right, as an opportunity to engage young people. And we also see it, I think, as a pathway to dynamic and robust forms and expressions of literacy. So if you think about reading and making and the kinds of things that emerge out of young people's experience with popular culture, remixing, hacking, uh, these are all things that, that in, in many respects uh, take place in relationship to, to popular culture. And just the ways that they begin to construct their own sense of who they are and, again, their relationship to the world. And so it's, 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 it's with, with this as, as a way of thinking about kind of why pop culture here at this conference, I think a, a lot of what we'll hear about today are, are the ways in which young people are beginning to leverage and use pop culture. If it's through fandom, uh, the work that, that Henry has, has sort of eloquently dealt with in his work, participatory culture, which has become in many ways a kind of crucial framework for a number of us. Andrew Slacker's work, thinking about how young people and, and his organization have taken a very popular franchise Harry Potter, and really turned it into a source of inspiration and, and a source of intervening in the world around them and how that comes, becomes a kind of a pathway, an important pathway for how young people begin to make sense of their world, but more importantly, how they began to create spaces for civic, social, political engagement, sort of beginning to realize their potential as agents of social change in their communities. And for those of you who, who are familiar with Mark Anthony Neal's work, you know that he is absolutely and widely considered uh, and respected for the work that he's done in terms of looking at pop culture, looking at popular music, looking at hip-hop studies, uh, the author of several books, um, and, and I think importantly uh, here, uh, the author of one of the, the critical, and I would argue sort of founding texts in terms of hip-hop studies, uh, Mark has certainly understood uh, what's at stake when we begin to think about young people's relationship to popular culture and how we begin to understand these pathways to, to empowerment, pathways to literacy, pathways to engagement, pathways to participating in the social and political world around them. And so we thought that it was important to, to in some way spotlight popular culture in that way because many of you are working with young people. You have organizations, libraries, museums, after school programs, community centers, schools, classrooms, and thinking about the ways in which pop culture can be utilized and to help you not only connect with young people but to create opportunities and spaces for young people to begin to reimagine who they might be in this world, particularly right as agents of social and political change. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Henry and our panelists, and we look forward to um, your, your remarks. I'm, I'm having trouble turning. Oh, we're on. Great. OK. Thank you. So Kathy Cohen was originally going to be part of this program, and you may have noticed her listed on the schedule. She had a family conflict and went yesterday instead. And if you were yesterday's plenary, you know that she handled herself very ably in that context. So I'm going to be stepping up. I was originally just going to be moderator. I'm going to step up as a panelist as well and try to balance between those two roles here. We said that we'd begin by each of us introducing ourselves and our work a little bit and sharing something that we're concerned about or passionate about, something that keeps us up at night or something that wakes us up in the morning. In this context, uh, I have a number of projects tied to the MacArthur Initiative. I'm going to do a shameless plug really quickly for one of my current projects and then talk a bit more fully about a second. 
The pro shameless plug is for this new book, uh, Reading in a Participatory Culture, Remixing Moby Dick in the English class Classroom, which is done jointly with Teacher College Press and the National Writing Project. And it grows out of the first phase of work that I've done with MacArthur. We, we, I wrote a white paper describing what media education looks like in an era of participatory culture. And Connie Yao challenged us to put that into practice. And so we developed a curriculum that used Moby Dick uh, to think more deeply about authorship and remix. And it was deeply inspired by an African-American educator and playwright, Ricardo Pizzuoli, who had been going into prisons in Rhode Island and working with incarcerated youth to get them to read Moby Dick. And I don't know about you, but I was utterly defeated by Moby Dick in high school. Right? I never got past the whiteness of the whale. I wrote a crappy paper. I got a C on it, and I never wanted to read the novel again until I met Ricardo who had done this phenomenal thing of working with these kids who were not only at risk, but already the system was giving up on them, uh, and saying, this is a difficult book, let's read it together. And the way he did it was getting them to rewrite Moby Dick. And he asked them to think about who these characters were in the 21st century. So if you were to tell Moby Dick today, you wouldn't be talking about the whaling trade and what these, these young gang members who were mostly in prison because of the war on drugs ended up talking about was the drug trade. Right? So Ahab as a gang leader, Ahab someone who's balancing the commercial interest of, of peddling drugs versus personal vengeance against someone who's done harm to his, in this case, her family. Uh, and how far does the gang's loyalty extend? And so as someone who'd studied fan fiction writing, I immediately recognized the move to retell the story, to flesh out the characters, to reimagine them. And so Ricardo and I began a dialogue which also involved when Kelly, who was a literature professor who worked on Melville, and Melville himself is someone who rewrote the culture of the 19th century and really sucked up everything in the 19th century that he could get, which is why Moby Dick is such a weird book, a weird and wonderful book, it turns out, but one that we have, it doesn't meet our sense of the boys on adventure story that we think it's going to be when we open it up. So in the course of this, we developed a curriculum that goes back and forth between hip hop, fan fiction, uh, various other kinds of remix practices, the, the play, the continuing influence of Moby Dick on contemporary culture. Uh, so everything from Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica to Pirates of the Caribbean, we sort of weave into this. We developed both the print book and there is now through Scalar at USC a digital book that uh, brings together more than 250 clips including a number of documentaries produced by my team, first in MIT, now at USC. Uh, I've got postcards for it. Some of them are floating around, and if anyone wants to access the free digital book, please do so. Now, the other project I'm going to allude to, and then I'm going to hand this off to our colleagues, and I'll talk about it a little more as the discussion goes along, is project with the Youth and Participatory Politics Network, which um, Ethan Zuckerman talked about in his opening remarks, we're really trying to explore how, what's this bridge between participatory culture and participatory politics. Recognize that culture is always already political, but there's been a struggle in cultural studies between figuring out how we explain what's political about the activities consumers play in engaging with popular culture. And so I've gone to the other end and said, let's look at institutional politics, look at look, look, look activism. Let's look at dream activists. Let's look at Occupy. Let's look at things we all recognize as undeniably political. And let's figure out in what ways they're connected back to popular culture, to participatory culture, to fan modes of fanish engagement. We've done now more than 200 interviews of young activists, and we're processing that into a book project. Uh, and there's a lot we're learning through that research, which I hope I'll draw on as I, as I make some of my remarks throughout the discussion today. So that said, let me turn it over to Mark. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? <laughs> and so uh, my work revolves around black popular culture. Um, it has for about 20 years now, uh, with a particular interest in looking at these intersections of race, gender, and sexuality, and now increasingly the digital world. Much of my work has always been concerned about making sure that it would be relevant to the kind of publics that I don't necessarily see in my classroom and don't read my books. Um, my kind of uh, role model for this was my father. My father was a functional illiterate. He dropped out of school in 10th grade. I always wanted to make sure that I did work that he would find some value in, and that's kind of been my guiding 
principle in terms of the type of work that I do. And because of that, I've always been committed to making my work accessible and public um, in certain kinds of ways. Um, in some ways, we talk about this in the context of, of public intellectuals, but I'm less interested in being on CNN and places like that, but actually creating a mode of work that circulates in particular publics that are accessible to certain kinds of folks, which is why digital culture has been really important to the kind of work that I do. There are lots of folks who do work on popular culture, and, and I often think about it in terms of two different models, one being a kind of archivist model. Um, and of course, there's a wealth of stuff that we can go back and look at in terms of pulling out, say, the popular culture of the 1930s or popular culture in the 19th century. There have been some great historical texts that have been published in the last year that do that kind of work. Um, but much of my work is much more of what we would call an interventionist model, um, which I would argue for those who do popular culture work is a much more difficult model. Because if something's happening right now, this is something that's going to trend over two or three months. We can't make, wait for the logic of the publishing industry, whether it be in terms of journals and books, to make that intervention two years from now. We have to make those interventions immediately. And of course, digital culture has allowed for us to be able to do this much more effectively. I, for instance, started writing for an online site called Pop Matters in 1999. Um, which is one of the really groundbreaking sites in terms of doing cultural studies work online. And it allowed us to context to be able to make these kinds of immediate interventions, right? Where what would have been a normative music review, for instance, that might have appeared in the Village Voice, you know, now becomes an entree into really thinking out loud and more broadly about what these cultural texts mean in any given moment. I'm also very much committed to the idea as an academic, as someone who's at some place like Duke, of leveraging the resources of the university to do this kind of public engagement. Within that means I've been producing and co-producing and hosting a, an online webcast called Left to Black for the last three years. We've done more than 100 episodes over the course of those three years. And the idea is that we shoot a half an hour show, 90% of the interviews are done via Skype. Um, we wanted to make sure that we didn't do a live show, even though there was some, uh, obviously, some benefits to doing it that way, but we wanted to make something that was very nicely produced. What it has allowed us to do is to do a half-hour show that's online. It's also filled with all of this archival information and archival data, whether it's photos or music and what have you. The show is broadcast, quote-unquote, live on YouTube Monday afternoons at 1.30. Um, it is then housed at our Tumblr site. It is housed at the John Hope Franklin site, which is our, um, uh, our, our co-producer on their YouTube site. And it's also available on iTunes University uh, in HD for free download. And part of the rationale for Left to Black, and even despite the title, was to be able to kind of fill certain kinds of gaps. How do we do for, take folks who are doing quality work as artists, as activists, as intellectuals that are related to the black community that are never going to show up necessarily in NPR or PBS or those kinds of corporate spaces and actually present it in the kind of way where they're talking like they're talking to regular folks? Um, so on an average Left of Black show, I'm literally sitting in front of a table with a huge monitor next to me, so it's as if the guest is sitting right there with me. Um, when we broadcast a show on Monday afternoons, we live tweet it, so we do want to have that kind of live participatory aspect of it, even if the show is not live, um, as we encourage the guests for that week to also live tweet their appearances on the show. In terms of my own work, um, and projects that I'm working on now, next month, um, uh, shameless plug again, uh, looking for Leroy, Illegible Black Masculinities will be published by New York University Press in a series that's edited by Henry and Karen Tongson. And it looks at this idea of legibility and illegibility in terms of performances of black masculinity. The way that I often tell this story is that if we see a black man with a basketball, we don't have to think twice about that, right? We know exactly what that is. If we see a black man with a violin, that gives us reason to pause, right? We have to figure out in our mind all kinds of questions that explains why this black man has a violin in his hand, right? And that's what I mean by legible versus illegible. So the labor of the book is to take very legible images of black masculinity and render them illegible. I read Jay-Z as a cosmopolitan queer, for example, and also taking illegible performances of black masculinity and rendering them much more legible to us. One of the things I want to say about that book in terms of digital culture is that it's a book that I began ostensibly black in 2003. Um, one of the reasons why it took so long because the technology wasn't actually in place for me to do the book the way that I wanted to. And it really wasn't until the emergence of broadband 
that gave me an archive that I could work with that I could actually do this book the way that I wanted to do, right? Suddenly I had available all of these digitized archived images and, and, and videos and what have you of black masculinity that I would not have had access to. The best example of this I use is one of the people that I talk about in a whole chapter is a gentleman by the name of Avery Brooks, well-known stage actor. Those of you who are sci-fi folks know him, of course, um, as the first black captain, Deep Space Nine, the Star Trek. Um, but he's been a long-time stage actor. Um, MFA, the first black MFA for Rutgers University. Um, he had a show in, in the late 1980s called A Man Called Hawk, which was a spinoff of Spencer for Hire. Um, he played an enforcer by the name of Hawk. The show was virtually impossible to find, and it wasn't until Broadband that could actually track down episodes of the show to write a whole chapter on this particular figure. The other project that I want to talk about real briefly that I'm thinking about because of my interest now in, in what's happening around digital culture and the digital humanities is a project called What If the Greensboro Four Had Twitter? And part of what that is about is to think about the ways that as we think about these relationships in, in terms of social media and technology, that some of these relationships actually existed historically already. So that when you think about the Greensboro Four and what happens in terms of the sit-in movement in the South in the spring of 1960, the language that we would use to describe that in 2013 is that it went viral. <laughs> um, and what was social media for them was a mimeograph machine. What was social media for them at the time was word of mouth. How do we go back even before then, two centuries, to think about field songs as a form of social media? All right. And so I'll stop there. Okay. Well, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, so hi, my name is Andrew Slack. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. All right, so Harry Potter Alliance, uh, some of you may know us, some of you may think, what is that? So let me start off by asking, who here has read Harry Potter? Okay, well that's a lot of the room. Uh, oh, but just for those of you who have not read Harry Potter, just so you know, uh, Harry Potter happens to be a very popular book series. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I didn't want to read it at first, but I was working with some kids, and they loved it so much. And then when I did read it, I was swept away. And I fell in love with these books. And I was a fan of these books. What I did not know was that there was an organized fan community uh, that was celebrating these books. And not in frivolous ways. In ways that were empowering them socially, helping their self-esteem, helping their social lives, and creating a whole new kind of community, one that was evolving with Web 2.0. Um, I like to look at this as, I call it ETR, Energy Talent Resources. Here we have a gigantic amount of young people who are growing up with Web 2.0, and it's also intergenerational, mind you, that are putting their ETR into celebrating Harry Potter by creating a sports league, the International Quidditch Association, <laughs> by creating very complex fan sites with huge debates that are academic, that are playful, that are ways of expressing their, roma their own personal romantic selves by, uh, by projecting them onto the Harry Potter characters. So there's a lot of personal work going on there um, through fan fiction, through wizard rock, which is literally music that is about Harry Potter, sung from the perspective of Harry Potter characters. And I kid you not, this is incredible music. And as I was seeing all of this, I was frustrated by one fact. If Harry Potter were in our world, he would do more than talk about Harry Potter. He would fight for justice in our world the way he fought for justice in his. In the books, Harry starts a student activist group named after his mentor Dumbledore called Dumbledore's Army. And the members of Dumbledore's army do many things, including training each other on using magic, what we could call creativity in this case, or imagination, or social media, on how to fight the dark arts in our world. They fight for equality uh, to ensure that there is a world where half-giants and werewolves don't have to live in the closet for being who they are. Harry Potter is literally forced to live in a closet for the first 11 years of his life. And we say, no one should have to live in the cupboard for their identity, which ties in to an LGBTQ issue. It also ties into issues around uh, immigration reform of, of uh, young people who are having to live in the closet for their identity as undocumented 
um, being quote unquote muggle born Americans. But what eventually happens is Dumbledore's army wakes the world up despite a consolidated media that refuses to pay attention to the, be the big bad guy Voldemort coming back. They wake the world up to the fact that Voldemort has come back. So there we have a consolidated media and media consolidation issues and media reform. And we're seeing in this myth so many parallels that are coming out of this one archetypal student activist group, Dumbledore's Army, where Harry says to the members, every great wizard has started off as nothing more than we are now students. If they can do it, why not us? And so I pose that question to the Harry Potter fan community. And the response I got was tremendous from a band called Harry and the Potters, who are two brothers who look like Harry Potter, dress like Harry Potter, and sing punk rock songs inspired by hardcore punk rock uh, from the perspective of Harry Potter. They began singing in libraries and getting very popular. They loved this idea, and together we created the Harry Potter Alliance, a Dumbledore's army for our world, asking the entire Harry Potter fan community, with all this ETR, Every great wizard in Harry Potter has started off as nothing more than we are now, students. If they can do it, why not us? Can't we wake our world up to ending genocide and human rights atrocities and global warming the way Dumbledore's army woke Vold uh, the world up to Voldemort's return? And by doing that and using this playful imagery by, and by partnering with pre-existing NGOs that were doing very, really effective work in the field, of course, those phone calls always started with, I'm from the Harry Potter Alliance, before you hang up. Um, we, we were getting a lot of media attention. And when we'd get media attention, the social media world of Harry Potter fan community would, would be get real excited and do more. And then we'd get more media attention, creating this incredible uh, virtuous cycle feedback loop. Uh, we have sent, we've, uh, we lost a battle in Maine in 2009 to pass marriage equality through a very innovative phone banking system where people could align with their Hogwarts house and get points based on how many phone calls they were making in Maine. And we came back recently in Maine and we won. We, we helped pass the Maryland Dream Act um, after a young person who's one of the leaders of our community, Julian Gomez, working with Jose Antonio Vargas, came out as an undocumented American, a muggle-born American, explaining the reason that he couldn't go to the biggest Harry Potter fan conference was not because he didn't have the money, but because he couldn't get it on an airplane. And it was a very uh, incredible way to, to get that message across uh, to our community. We're right now working to try to get Warner Brothers to make all Harry Potter chocolate fair trade in an effort uh, to highlight the cocoa industry's corruption around exploitation of farmers and child slavery. We've sent five cargo planes to Haiti, uh, named after each plane named after a different Harry Potter character. We've built libraries across the world we have over 130 chapters now and about 40 volunteers. J.K. Rowling has praised us in Time Magazine. And all of this for me leads back to this question that people think, okay, well, you're, you're a cool ruse to get people into progressive activism. Not so. I mean, that's part of it. But this is tapping into the whole self where we can see ourselves as change makers today and that the heroes that we're inspired by today, whether we are eight which is not our demographic, normally it's 15 to 25, or you know, teenagers, or older, we have the chance, those heroes are whispering for us to join them in our world. That fantasy is not an escape from our world, but an invitation to go deeper into it. This is a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous loss when we ignore that. I call this model of change cultural acupuncture, where we find the energy in the culture and we move that energy authentically to create a healthier body for our world. Stories are the needles. Stories are what resonate. And in terms of what gets me most excited right now is how to take this to the next level. We have a proof of concept with the Harry Potter lines. Imperfect, like all organizations. But it's a wonderful proof of concept that has created so much heart and love and positivity and community. We say the weapon we have is love in the organization. Um, based on Harry's greatest weapon against Voldemort, which is love. We, we're multi-issue. We also focus on personal development, all that stuff. But how can we apply this to other fan communities? So we're starting an approach to do that, to do just that with the Hunger Games and Doctor Who and uh, John Green and the Nerd Fighters. How do we convert that into learning communities? How do we get schools to begin picking this up 
that when students walk into school, they saw movies on a Friday night. And those movies correlate to moments in history, to, to interesting things in science, and to ways to motivate those students to not only learn about current events as passive audience members, but to engage in current events as the people who are going to actually shape them. And thirdly, so first, how do we take this cultural acupuncture idea towards all fan communities? Secondly, how do we take this into our learning communities uh, after school, schools, et cetera? And thirdly, how do we use the power of popular culture, how we know storytelling works, to tell this incredible moment that we are right now as a human race, where we can do so much with the internet, where we have so many threats like global warming, and how do we create, Joseph Campbell would say, we need new myths for our times. How do we build off of these myths to create myths that help us interpret our times? So those are those three questions that we're asking with this new venture, a project called Imagine Better. And damn, I get real excited when I wake up in the morning asking how we're going to be doing that. It is a big undertaking, but we have a lot of amazing people that are, that are making it happen with us. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Andrew. So, I want us to start by drilling down a bit more about our core terms and concepts. So what do we mean by popular culture? For example, the term is often equated by educators with commercial culture. Can one engage with popular culture while maintaining, remaining critical of the companies that produce it or the commercial motives that shape it? So i let you guys get started with that. <laughs> um, I, I, I tend not to get into conversations about fine descriptions. I, I will make a, dis a distinction between, say, popular culture and folk culture, um, that kind of culture that comes out of uh, ethnic experiences as one example of that. I very much think about popular culture as commercial, as, as commercial culture, both in terms of mainstream corporate products, but also in terms of what we might deem as more underground culture. For me, popular culture is an important site because it is a site of ideological production. Um, whether it's, and particularly it, because it is coming from corporate entities, it's important for us to be able to engage popular culture within that context with all of the problems that are associated with it. Um, much of my own relationship to popular culture, at least in the classroom, really does come from a pedagogical standpoint. So no matter how problematic popular culture might be, particularly in terms of race, gender, sexuality, a range of other issues, violence, um, there is a space in order to be able to use it to redeem certain kinds of values or to produce alternative values in response to dealing with popular culture. Okay, Andrew? Um, yeah, I mean, and I, 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 off of uh, some of that, you know, we're, nobody owns a story. Stories have been around since the beginning of humanity. I think the only thing more primal is motherhood and music. So uh, stories are primal. This concept of, of, uh, of, of ownership is fairly new. The internet is bringing us back to something that's ancient and old. And it's, uh, it's causing a lot of confusion right now for everybody um, as to who owns the rights to a story. Um, intellectual property, yes, but nobody owns the intellect. Uh, so a couple things. Twilight presents problems for us in the Harry Potter fan community. Um, I, I was reading the first book, and I actually was loving it. And I was bragging about how much I loved it to some of our 17-year-old members, most of which were female in this case. And they were like, no, stop, stop reading. First book's good, after that, no, it's all disempowerment of women. Don't, 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 it's the devil. Um, now, I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna say that it is, but we don't necessarily celebrate every text, and there's a lot of critique of texts that has to happen. But going to this issue of ownership, you know, our first big foray into going into something besides Harry Potter is, you know, if you look at YA literature, you've got Harry Potter blew everything up, then you had Twilight, then you had the Hunger Games. So we did a campaign called Hunger is Not a Game when the movie came out last year. Nice. And um, when, when the, uh, the film was released on the night, the, the, the night before it was released, the New York Times ran this incredible article about our campaign with Oxfam to create anti-hunger activists across the world and connecting those issues to issues in Pan Am and the Capitol uh, in the Hunger Games, for those who have read the Hunger Games. Um, Lionsgate essentially tried to shut down the whole campaign, which was really weird uh, uh, for them to do that on the night that the movie was released. And I, as a fan, was going to the movie. Uh, I was at the Cheesecake Factory with friends to have a pre-dinner 
before going to like a midnight release and I didn't know what to do. Uh, and some of our partners were saying, well, let's just handle, let the lawyers handle this. And I was like, lawyers? Courts? No, 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 court, court, the only court here is the court of public opinion. We win there. I don't know what happens on the other side. That side scares me. So um, I sent this to Alyssa Rosenberg, um, who's a culture journalist, and she put out an article in, early in the morning after I saw The Hunger Games. I woke up with best-selling young adult authors tweeting about this, uh, eventually Judd Apatow tweeting about this, saying, doesn't Lionsgate have enough money? What's their problem? Um, the New York Times reporting, LA Times reporting. Um, I had a date that night that I couldn't get out of. Um, so I was on that date and I got a tweet um, that said, uh, LA Times reporting Lionsgate has rescinded, which I was like, whoa. And I was like, this was a first date with this person. I was like, <laughs> uh, I was like uh, my life just went crazy. Um, and then Lionsgate called and they really humanized the issue for me as to the pressure that they were under as a movie studio. And um, it's a complicated story, but needless to say, Lionsgate was not the villain. Uh, what really was the villain was the lack of communication that happened and a kind of dehumanization that happened. Even though we'd let them know about the campaign and they even said best of luck, you know, there's all these different um, segregated departments, et cetera. And so that was, that was something that happened and hopefully we'll be working with Lionsgate, I hope, uh, if anybody knows them, tell them we really want to work with them um, for the next movie. Either way, we're going we're gonna to work on it. But th what makes this even more complicated is our relationship with Warner Brothers because they own the rights to Harry Potter. And we have really, really been Gryffindors, meaning uh, really brave about this, saying we do not want chocolate sold in Harry Potter's name. Hermione would not be happy about this <laughs> if, if Harry's name was being used to uh, sell chocolate that was coming from Coco that was coming from child slaves. Not to mention, we are all at risk from Dementor attacks. Chocolate is what's used after a Dementor attack. If that chocolate has no magical property in it because it came from child slavery, we're, we're screwed. So, so, uh, so we sent this to Warner Brothers. They applauded us for our efforts around, everyone loves to talk about our planes to Haiti. So the CEO of Warner Brothers was like, we love the planes to Haiti, great job, we love the books. Uh, this thing a little more complicated, but we'll talk about it, let's talk. We sent them an independent report um, from free to work uh, a partner organization that gave Harry Potter chocolate an F in human rights. Now, can you imagine a Joss Whedon story about children going to Orlando uh, to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter chocolate and eating chocolate made by child slaves? This is so Joss Whedon. It's children eating children. It's really gross. Um, and so uh, we sent them that F in human right, that F report. They sent a letter back saying, we appreciate your inquiry, but you know what? We did our own report. We're cool. Don't worry about it. Our report says we're good. I said, awesome. That's great. Can you show us the report? They said, no. I said, why? They said, Pfft. Then now we have a campaign called showustthereport.com, which is really going viral on the internet. Uh, and we're getting major YouTube celebrities who in some cases aren't really even correlated with Harry Potter, saying they want corporate transparency. So now Warner Brothers is waking up a sleeping giant. They did that a year ago in a much bigger way with SOPA, uh, but, but they're doing it in a more minor way here, and we're, we're gonna have to wake these companies up to the 21st century. The game has changed. If they're in the money-making business, they need to approach it differently. If we're in the social justice-making business, we just we cannot be afraid of the fact that they think they have power. So. So my, my mentor in grad school was John Fisk, and Fisk used to make a distinction between mass culture and popular culture, mm -hmm. which is a fairly useful one, or at least is a theoretical distinction. And his point was mass culture is mass-produced, mass-marketed, mass-consumed. And popular culture is what happens when we embed it in our own lives and make it our own. So it's, it's a, it's a, one's a category of production, the other is a category of active consumption and transformation. So some of the examples Andrew just gave you are wonderful examples of how resources produced by Warner Brothers you know, become resources that are of popular culture and popular politics. And that distinction is worth holding on to. Although it gets much, much blurrier in an age of Web 2.0, right? Where what is being sold to us is often stuff we created ourselves. So when people hear me talking about participatory culture, they often assume I'm celebrating in some way Web 2.0. And I keep wanting to make a very clear distinction 
between those two categories. You know, I think that if we talk about participatory culture, there's been 150, 200 year history of grassroots communities of all kind trying to gain access to the means of cultural production and circulation. I often talk about the toy printing press movement of the 19th century. We could talk about amateur made films that, in the black community that reacted to the birth of a nation. Mm -hmm. We could talk about the culture of amateur radio that Brecht celebrated as a, a source of potential political participation. We could go through that history. Web 2.0 is a business model. It's less than six years old. Uh, it's attempts to commoditize and capitalize on the participatory energies of the culture. So we finally reached this moment where we have a systems of, of widespread production and distribution within reach. You know, I, I always now say a more participatory culture because there are massive numbers of people who are not able to participate for all kinds of obstacles and we really have to be attentive to those obstacles. But we've moved the arrow toward a more participatory culture. But Web 2.0 represents an attempt that commodifies our culture as quickly as we produce it. And the kind of participatory culture communities I study, whether it's activists or fans and, or the combination of the two, have been among the earliest critics of that move to commercialize and commodify participatory culture. So if you look at something like the Organization of Transformative Works, which was created by fandom to speak out on fair use, to create nonprofit platforms for sharing fan-produced materials, to create an academic journal, to, be, to lobby Washington, to sort of create more exemptions to copy protection policies. That's a fan activist group that has embraced, speaks from a position of fan, but is deeply critical of the mechanisms of Web 2.0. So as we think about it, I think we can't easily separate them. It's a, easier to separate them theoretical than practically, but we have to maintain that distinction in order to be critical of the kinds of manipulation and exploitation that Web 2.0 companies are involved with. So, next question for the panel. Popular culture has often been positioned as an enemy of civic and political engagement, as in phrases like weapons of mass distraction or bread and circuses, i.e. pop culture gets framed as distraction. How might we reimagine the relations between popular culture and politics in a more productive term? For the work that I do and, and the stuff that I've studied in the communities I'm, that I'm really concerned about, um, popular culture actually has been an entree into politics. Um, it was a way, you think about the early days of hip hop, particularly in the 1980s when blackness becomes much, as Richard Eitan argues in his book on politics and black popular culture, where blackness becomes much more hyper visible than it was in any previous era. Um, you suddenly have this kind of televisual frame on blackness that gives us the Michael Jacksons and the Michael Jordans and the Mike Tysons and the Whitney Houstons and the Bill Cosbys in ways that blackness had not circulated in American popular culture prior to that point in time. And one of the things that hip hop did was to use popular culture as a vehicle to be able to offer their voice, their narrative into these situations. You think about early hip hop videos and the way that the local was always so present. Right? We're not going to shoot a video on a sound stage someplace. We're going to shoot the video in our hood. Um, we're going to claim our hood. We're going to claim the places and spaces that are critical to us in our hood. We're even going to claim kind of icons of our hood in that kind of context. It really created, I would argue, in terms of the way hip hop videos were shot around this kind of localized culture, a kind of nationalized black youth culture that we hadn't seen before. Right, hip hop videos, visuals, even more so than the music, become kind of a lingua franca uh, for this hip hop generation in the 1980s to begin to have kind of common conversations. At the same time that folks are also dealing with the emergence of figures like Jesse Jackson and his two presidential runs, Louis Farrakhan in terms of the Nation of Islam, which brings Malcolm X back to, in vogue amongst this kind of generations of folks. And so I think for, for my work, it has always been the, how do we utilize popular culture? How do we popularize um, critical movements within the black community? How do we popularize those issues that are most concerned of us within our communities? When we think about the role that popular culture played, for instance, in the insurrections in 1992 in the aftermath, the acquittal of the four police officers, the LAPD, the Rodney King beating, um, and, and listening to Ice Cube, the album that he releases immediately after this, and he's very clear, we've been telling you this all this time. 
gangster rap in many ways. It, you know, there's lots of ways that we can frame gangster rap, but gangster rap was in fact a response to the prison industrial complex as it was played out in terms of the buy and bust policing policies of the LAPD in the 1980s and 1990s, right? That's what these songs were narratives of. Um, those who, who are from LA may remember things like the Batarang, like the literal machine that they would literally take into black neighborhoods. Toddy T made a song in 1985 called Batarang about this machine that would go into black neighborhoods and batter down the houses, right? Because they suspected there were drugs in, the, in these places. So for me, popular culture is never something that's outside of politics, right? And of course, really savvy politicians, we could use Barack Obama as one bad example, um, have often found ways to utilize popular culture in that way, right? To become much more relevant, right? And, and the way that he exploited in many ways his kind of uh, relationship to hip hop in, in 2008 to give him a certain kind of visibility amongst hip hop generation voters or hip hop 2.0 generation of voters that is an exa another example of the ways you know, popular culture goes hand in hand, I think, with, pol with politics in that regard. Yeah, and, and, and off of that, Mark, I think um, in, uh, in the transmedia community, people continue to use the word story world, you know, complete immersion in a story. Uh, and if we want to look at really good uh, storytellers going back even a, a few decades before, I mean, I was kind of shocked having grown up learning the story of Dr. King and, and the civil rights movement to find out just how beautiful the civil rights movement organizers were as storytellers. That in, in Montgomery, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, there were teenage moms that refused to give up their seat. Um, and were arrested, but the civil rights workers didn't find that as a compelling story for the larger American public to see. So they hand-selected Rosa Parks, and they trained her at the Highlander Center. And then they made it look like, oh my God, this is all so spontaneous. And there were spontaneous things like ha that happened. Like, they didn't, no one realized that MLK was going to be such an incredible speaker. But, but uh, creating these story worlds is really important in our in our politics, not just in our popular culture. So education and politics have a tremendous amount to learn from the way that Hollywood and great storytellers have created stories. And I think that, um, that George W. Bush's campaign of 2004 and, Bar and both of Barack Obama's campaigns have done a tremendous job of laying out a story world and, uh, and sticking to it. Um, I don't think I answered your question, Henry. No, no it's, it's, it's a good answer. <laughs> so let me build on, on your story world idea. I was at, visited the site of Occupy Wall Street in the fall of 11. And as I arrived, a busload pulled up full of zombies. There was an entire bus of people dressed like zombies who came pouring out into the, joining the protest, <laughs> right? And it turned out they had been going to a local horror fan convention in New York and decided to bus over to participate in the <laughs> Occupy protest, right? And in part, it's because the zombie was becoming an international symbol of the <laughs> Occupy movement. Uh, they're standing in for undead corporations who should have been allowed to die, but lived off the blood, lifeblood of the 99%. So it became a very powerful mm. image. That day, there were other people dressed up like characters from Game of Thrones, uh, who were the La calling themselves the Lannister 1%. Uh, saying winter is coming. There were the people there from Occupy Sesame Street that told us that 1% of the monsters get 99% of the cookies, <laughs> right? All of those people were involved in a politics of creating images, creating videos, <laughs> sending them into circulation. When the pepper spray cop incident occurred at UC Davis, 200 things poured out of that community, 200 remixes of photographs, film stills, famous paintings with the pepper spray cop in it. And what had been a local incident began to travel across the internet, became what I call spreadable content, and mobilized people very, very effectively to be, become involved in political events. If we look at most of the key movements of the last two to three years, pop culture is being used in very much this way. Mm -hmm. So my team's been doing work on dream activists. And <laughs> The superhero has emerged there as a really interesting metaphor for thinking about the experience of being undocumented in the United States. So if you think about it, there is probably no better exemplar of the illegal alien than Kal-El of the planet Krypton, hmm. 
who snuck across the border in the middle of the night, you know, right, pick, gets adopted by an Anglo family, given a false identity, lives in hiding for the rest of his life, uh, but nevertheless fights for truth, justice in the American way, right? Um, so that many undocumented have embraced the superhero as a way of telling their own story. If we think about the last election cycle, we could think about the binders of women as maybe being a peak moment where the grassroots mobilized by appropriating and remixing content to make a political message. Because if you watch the news coverage on CNN after that debate, they didn't even reference that line. If you picked up Twitter, you saw spontaneously women all across America, all kinds of women reacted within seconds to that line. <coughs> By the time the debate was done, the Tumblr site was up. One of my grad students tried to submit a, a, a meme to the site a day later and was told that they'd already received 2,000 memes and they were trying to process it. Right? So the news media has tended to say, doesn't this represent the trivialization of American politics? And I'd argue, in fact, that it forced the news media to do its job because those memes circulating led to a bunch of stories, starting with the fact that Romney hadn't actually commissioned the binders of women. It was a feminist group that was going to give it no matter who was elected governor, that yes, he appointed women to his cabinet, but only the low-level cabinet positions, that when those women left, they weren't replaced by women, and why did he need binders to begin with? Because there were no women on the executive board of Bain Capital, right? So each of those were stories by different journalists that tra translated over multiple news cycles, all of which was driven by the fact that the public could easily take sample remix media content and connecting this up with sarcastic Willy Wonka or whatever, send that message out to the world. And so I think we're the, we are in a moment where our politics is driven by our capacity to quote and mobilize around popular, popular culture. The Harry Potter Alliance may be an extreme version of that, but in fact, we're seeing it across almost every major political movement at the present time, a different relationship to the contents of popular media. Henry, can you, um, can you, um, you talk about avatar activism? Mm. It's just such a great example. Well, it's a global example, right? What we've seen around the world uh, I, the one I tell most often is the story of people, uh, of Palestinians in the occupied territory dressing up like Navi from James Cameron's uh, avatar and chanting to the border police, um, you know, sky people, you can't have our land, right? Mobilizing this myth and creating videos. And this group marched through the occupied territory every week and got about 100 viewers per video. And this one got millions of viewers because of the spectacle of people painted blue riding on the ground for tear gas attacks from the border guards. Pretty powerful set of images. But it's part, if we look around the world, there have been dozens of uses of the mask of, of the Navi by protest groups, dressing up as blue people and speaking out through that fictional mythic identity to challenge all kinds of local big bads, to use a jo Josh Whedon term. Uh, that, and I, I think we're going to see more and more of our politics conducted in that way. Um, let's pull this into the educational realm for a, a bit, and then maybe we can see how, see how things are going. So educators and parents often concerned about, talk, express concerns about the risk of bringing popular culture into the classroom. Risks that are as varied as concerns about distraction and overstimulation on the one hand, or controversy and antisocial values on the other. Uh, or the question of copyright and fair use as we're involved in remix and mashup. So are those risks worth taking? And if so, what advice would you guys have to teachers struggling with how to engage with the kinds of materials we're talking about today? So I'll start by asking the folks over in the far corner to set up my clip now. Um, I, I think those are important questions, Henry. Um, for me, as someone who's a product of, of a remix culture, if you will, who find value in that. One of the things I do, for instance, at Duke, I teach a class called Sampling Soul, which I co-teach uh, with a hip-hop producer by the name of Ninth Wonder, won a Grammy Awards a few years ago with, with, with Mary, J., uh, Mary J. Blige. And one of the things that we do with the class is that because it's Sampling Soul, we spend some time talking about the history of soul music and its social and political import. But at the same time, it, we're also talking about the use of soul music as kind of raw data. 
uh, for hip hop culture and what kind of question that raises around questions of fair use around intellectual property. So we spent a fair amount of the class talking about intellectual property law and what's fair use, what that looks like on a mixtape versus what that looks like when it's an actual produce from one of these corporate entities. The part of the thing that we really get into is, you know, fair use is really about, you know, are you on the one hand able to produce something that's new and distinct from what the original product was, of course, but also to be able to get students to think about, on, on a basic level, the way that their creativity can shape existing text. And one of the one examples that I use over and over in the class is the example of an artist by the name of Pierre Benu, who's based out of Baltimore, has a production company called Exit the Apple. I first became aware of Banu's work about five years ago when I saw a video that he shot for a song uh, from an artist called Imani Yazuri. Um, and it's called Moon Sunchild. And, and he <coughs> takes the song, Sun Moon Child, excuse me, he takes the song and he brings in these incredible clips of black artists, musical artists, dance performers, and, and everything's in sync, right? It's, it's, it's an amazing piece of product uh, in that regard, digital product in that regard. And of course, YouTube came after him at some point um, because of copyright infringement. We're, we're suspecting that it was from the Jackson family because Michael Jackson was, was all over this kind of video. Um, and eventually, you know, one of the things that I use, ex I use the actual video in the classroom as an exam for us to talk about how do we protect fair use within that regard, making the point over and over again that this is literally a video that I could use to teach a 15-week course on black expressive culture. Right? I mean, it was that dense in terms of the kind of things that it contained. One of the projects that Benu has also been working on, which I'm going to show in a second, um, is a series called Black Moses Barber. Right? And of course, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the death of, of Harriet Tubman. And so it's a series of videos, three of them that he did, in which he imagines black Barbie, a black Barbie, as Harriet Tubman. Right? And so uh, hopefully they'll be able to put the clip up real quick. <laughs> Black Moses Bobby. Oh no, I think oh, we're we lost. will never be free. Hey kids, looking for freedom? It's, it's Harriet Black Tubman. Moses. On the other side of this tree, you'll find a cave. Go through mm -hmm. the cave, make a quick left, and you'll see a boat. Okay. Inside of that boat, you'll see a pair of oars. Freedom Oars! Wow! Paddle north and make your way to freedom. Runaway Christy? Yeah, Runaway Ken? This is all kind of scary. Freedom, true freedom, is daunting. I know Runaway Ken, but... You have come this far, but you have to know you're ready. You know she's been known to hold a gun on folks who... Hesitate. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. Black Moses Barbie comes complete with motivational freedom rifle. Freedom or so. <laughs> so, Benu did the first one of these clips about two years ago. They're all three you can actually access from his site. Um, it became an interesting discussion a few months ago when Django Unchained came out and we found out there were these dolls that went with it and it was kind of a big protest. And, and one of my interventions to that conversation was that, you know, part of what Banu's talking about is a response to this, because part of what the video does is that we know Mattel would do something like this, right? That it, it would be some sort of Black History Month. <laughs> thing, right? You know, Black Moses Barbie, right? But, but it'd be gutted of all the kind of historical value of this figure. But I kept thinking about what would it have been like, particularly for young girls, who saw, and, and thinking about Django Unchained, for instance, as an example of this, and all these conversations about how Broomhilda didn't have any agency, Kerry Washington's character, that we very rarely hear her speak. And I'm just imagining what it would be like to be a seven or eight-year-old girl, right, who could, in fact, enact their own slave insurrection with a Black Moses Barbie, talking about participatory culture in a kind of way, particularly when our narrative about that period of time very rarely actually talks about gendered relationships in that regard, right? We don't see, with the exception of Harriet Tubman, see black women in our studies of slavery as having that kind of agency. It really is about these kind of male figures within that context. And in some ways, what Benu is talking about is taking this commercial culture, right, 
fair use and having young girls, young boys even, reimagine the world, right, by taking control of these products themselves. Whoa. Well, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, well, I'm just a little stunned by that. That was really... Um, what was the question again? It was about education. Education, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> education, so, fair use, distraction. Uh, yeah. Distraction, that's a good thing to keep in mind. <laughs> and I, 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 wanna, I really want to answer that. I'm so eager to answer this question, but I, I also want to just throw in there that you know, within the Harry Potter Alliance, we, we do have a diverse set of members um, from, so, from different socioeconomic backgrounds, from different races, et cetera. But still, unfortunately, and this is something that really bothers the crap out of me, is that uh, is that it's, you're still dealing with pretty privileged white kids. And, and, and Harry Potter is unprivileged in the beginning, but then becomes privileged, and he's white. And so, you know, as we're talking about race here, I, I want to make sure that we're, 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 we're merging these things. So um, uh, Henry brought up t to me a few months ago that the Rainbow Coalition that Jesse Jackson had, had predicted ended up coming in 2012. A little bit later than he predicted, but it ended up coming. Um, and uh, there was, there was. I'm trying to follow Twitter as best I can. And somebody asked if if what we're doing with Harry Potter is a white savior complex. I sure hope not. But but we are in danger of doing that because Harry Potter is to some degree a savior, and he also is white. Um, and uh, and there are problematic languages. So I just want to address that as a thing for us to continue to talk about because it's something that I'm wrestling with, and I don't have a good answer yet. Um, so we're going to have to come up with that one together. Um, but as for education, um, I'm, I'm so excited because so much of the work we've done has been about activism, but what's come out in the research about us and, and in, in meeting our chapter members and really talking is that they're learning through doing. They're learning through connecting uh, the, the stories that they love with the stories in the world with their own personal story and their own sense of agency. And we're talking about connected learning that's just so freaking connected, it's hard to even map where all the connections are being made all at once. And I'll just give an example of back when I was a broke comedian, um, years and years ago, I was substitute teaching, and I was put in front of the shop class, and I don't know anything about shop. Um, and the, the teacher knew that, so he had me do a study hall uh, with the kids. And the kids are all in there, and they're like, they have very thick Boston accents. Hey, Mr. Slack, Mr. Slack, uh, can I go to the bathroom? Um, and I said, you know what, why don't we all just like do something together? And they wanted to know what I wanted to do. I said, let's, let's make a superhero story together. And uh, we started talking about, well, what does that mean? What superpowers does he or she have? Most of the class were boys. It ended up being a boy, the superhero. Uh, we talked about, you know, I guided them. but they were, they were coming up with us. I said, we need him to have something very traumatic to happen to him in his early life. We also need him to be nervous around girls. And, and, and as we're talking about this, they're talking about themselves um, and their own traumas and their own losses. And somehow the supervillain is tied to the, the act of trauma in the beginning. This is just following basic Joseph Campbell model here in education. Well, the supervillain was this idealistic scientist, you know, very uh, Spider-Man-esque kind of bad guy who had good intentions, who ended up going crazy. And, and we begin building this story world. And I did this recently with a 13-year-old kid that my mom wanted me to talk to. Was and and watching, watching this class, their eyes get wide. They were so excited. But then correlating that to moments in history and to moments that are happening right now in Darfur, et cetera, at the same time that we're coming up with this story, I've had kids come up to me after some of these experiments that I've done, and I've done a number of them, mainly with underprivileged kids, and said, I have no idea how I just learned so much in two hours. We just covered more than I've ever covered in like two months. But that, that wasn't that hard, because it was just focusing on their interest in story. It's human interest in story. And when we don't respect that, it's like, I don't know what we're respecting. Hmm. I, I don't even know what the question is. I, I'm so perplexed by the current conversation about education the notion of the word failing schools and success and achievement, I don't even know if the people that are putting that forward have asked seriously philosophical questions as to what they mean by that. What do they want? Like, what do we want? We're humans. Like, let's, let's be human together. And stories do that. They provide this unique mechanism, and we see it in religion. We are not religion. 
but, uh, but we see it in religion, where people can talk about themselves, their friends, their community, their, the issues of social justice that are happening, and their relationships to mythological characters. And it's like on Facebook. You go on Facebook and you find out, I'm friends with this person. Oh, I don't even know this person, but we have a mutual friend. Well, turns out, like, I have a mutual friend with Ron Weasley, and there's, like, a billion other people that have a mutual relationship with Ron Weasley. So we're all connected on some level. So off of all that, we're working with the Pearson Foundation. They're giving us an in-kind donation to uh, have a curriculum specialist work with me this summer to come up with curriculum on how we can use blockbuster popular culture that kids are doing right now. They're coming in. It's not Tabula Rosa. I'm not pronouncing that right. But they're coming in and they're uh, with a lot of interest in the stories they just saw. I, I don't know. I liked waiting for Superman, to be clear. But there was this moment, I actually talked to the filmmaker recently, I said, you know the moment I really didn't like was you were talking about the ideal model of education was um, a teacher opening up students' brains and putting slop in there. And you referred to it as slop. And you said the problem was that bureaucratic teachers unions, etc., are stopping the slop from getting into the students' brains. I said, I think the problem with education is that you think that's the solution, that, that, that we should be opening up children's brains, when in fact this is about relationship building together in our relationship with stories. So we're working uh, to create this curriculum that uses popular stories of the imagination to look at our mentors and our heroes in the stories that we love and that we're looking at now. And then connecting that to our own sense of agency and personhood, but also our role as being civically engaged and our power to send spells, you know, in terms of Harry Potter, uh, through this. Uh, Instagram spells, Twitter spells, etc. How to make things spreadable is learning a kind of magic. So we really think we're onto something in converting what we've done with fan activism and what we continue to do with fan activism into the educational space. Now, second to that, I'm really interested in the fact that we have so many innovators at DML, and if we can all come together and think of ourselves not only as a community but as an organized social movement. Because right now in the U.S. we have the Common Core, which is providing the hardware, but we're all providing software by coming up with really interesting curriculum. We need teachers to be protected to be able to use that software mm -hmm. by creating demands, by showing that the stuff works, and forming an unprecedented coalition of educators who are shockingly you know, prioritizing learning and community. Two words that were not getting prioritized when I was watching Rahm Emanuel against teachers unions in Chicago recently. Those words were not being used. It was more about teacher salaries and tenure, all interesting subjects. But let's get to the core of this, which is that students are eager to learn. And why do they think school sucks? They don't need to. And, and uh, I'm going to stop. I'm going to get off the soapbox. But there's a lot of exciting possibilities there. You know, on, on my Good days, I'm, I'm very optimistic that a politics based on popular culture can be more inclusive and diverse. Uh, if you look at the work that youth and participatory politics have done, we discover that the gaps between young people's involvement in participatory politics, uh, the racial divide's much narrower than it is in terms of traditional politics. That is, there's very little separating Latino participation, black participation, white participation, when we look at the kinds of political practices that we're talking about today. That's the good news. The bad news is the majority of all races and all young people are not politically involved, but those who are are more likely to be involved through remixing, recirculating content, uh, engaging in online forums and so forth than they are by traditional criteria. And the optimist in me wants to say that if we can gather together by talking about popular culture rather than politics, if our point of entry is popular culture, perhaps we get outside of those bubbles that everyone's already talking about where the conservatives go to one site and the liberals go to another, we in fact watch Glee and, and the red states and the blue states and people's fantasies and hopes around popular culture does create some common ground sometimes for conversations that need to be had. That said, I have to deal with the reality that the fan conventions I go to in my research are probably some of the most segregated spaces that I encounter in the United States today. The, the, the fandom is sharply divided. This is something many fans are deeply concerned with, but don't necessarily know the answers to. 
And I think we're seeing in the last four or five years, the fan community itself really try to tackle race, but often it awkwardly ends up with everyone cornering the one person of color who showed up at the meeting <laughs> and asking them to explain to them why there aren't more people of color in the room, right? Which means that person doesn't come back next time. You know, it's, it's a painfully awkward process. One of the things that did give me hope <coughs> was the race bender movement. This was around the television series Last Airbender, which had a multiracial, multicultural cast on television. The fans of it, who were mostly white and Asian youth, uh, this, were outraged when the film, this show was being made into a feature film. And uh, the casting decision was made to cast most of the characters as white, uh, what they were calling white casting, which is a very common practice in Hollywood at the moment. And these young people used every, all of the infrastructure of fandom to go after uh, the studio and challenge them publicly about this white casting, to educate themselves on the history of race and casting in Hollywood. And they formed alliances with Asian American organizations and other groups that might have a, a shared interest in this protest. Um, they were not successful at changing Hollywood's casting decision but they changed the discursive frame. And so as, as I traced the reviews of this film across the country, uh, what we saw was again and again, the news media had to call out the white casting of the characters in the review because the protest was there. And so this was, a, for me, a sliver of a sign that there might be possibilities of alliances between the kinds of communities that are, we're all speaking up, up here, right? People of color, and these very white, nerdy fanboys and girls figuring out a way to talk to each other and work together toward common interest at a moment where we all know the racial demographics and the political shifts taking place in the United States today. We've got to find a way across these divides. So I'll end with another quick example. MC Lars is a nerdcore performer, which is a very kind of white version of hip hop that does reference the popular culture. Through our, some of the work we're doing in LA, he's been going into the Robert F. Kennedy School in South Central LA, working with mostly low-income Hispanic youth, and help getting them excited about the works of Edgar Allan Poe through using hip-hop. So this is a kind of educational intervention. Uh, but what they ended up producing is a very powerful music video called um, The Red Death Will Crash Your Party. Uh, and it's essentially about class inequality, about segregation, uh, but done through the lens of Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Mask of Red Death, uh, which they read is about some very real phenomenon in their, their experience of segregation in Los Angeles. So again, these are simage moments of hope amidst a reality that is that pop culture doesn't necessarily bring us together. It can easily segregate us, especially along racial lines, and it's something that as we advocate for politics based on pop culture, we have to be deeply attentive to. So, yes, I think we should open up the floor for questions. Is there a mic out there or? Um, yes, 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 there are mics. I, I see there are mics on either side. Now I do the stewardess thing. Uh, if, we'd love to hear questions from people. Uh, hopefully we said something provocative here today that you might want to pick up on and respond to. Yes. but on the Harry Potter Alliance and how you choose your sites of activism. Like, for example, you're fighting against hunger, you're doing things kind of on that worldly way. And I am pushing back on that white savior complex. Like, for example, how do you get the Harry Potter Alliance to mobilize for Brooklyn, for Kamani Gray, for that frozen zone in Brooklyn what, right what, now? You know what, just, I'm so, uh, how do you get the Harry Potter Alliance to mobilize Kamani Gray? For Kamani Gray. I'm going to stand, I'm, you're, you're going to push me back all the way up through, through the stage, Kama, Kamani? Gray, um, and, and don't feel bad because I, I didn't know the story until about 18 hours ago myself. Okay, um, I do feel bad. So, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> um, but Kamani Gray is a 16-year-old African-American youth that was shot, shot by uh, Brooklyn police officers last weekend. There have been three or four nights of rioting. <laughs> Um, in Brooklyn, uh, well, that's how it's been termed in the media. I'm sure it's very different on the ground as community and particularly youth are responding to the, to the murder uh, of this student. Uh, and so I guess your question is asking in what ways the Harry Potter Alliance 
would be able to leverage their influence to be able to engage that kind of on the ground activity? So uh, I appreciate the pushback, first of all. So thank you. Um, the, uh, the, it's a complicated question, right? I feel bad that we didn't do more about Trayvon Martin when that was coming out last year. Um, so first I wanna, I wanna say that we have yet to become, uh, uh, you know, where the commissioner of Gotham can send out a bat signal and the Harry Potter lines comes to every, <laughs> every time something bad happens because things just, a lot, there's a, as, as the nerd fighters say, uh, there's world suck, which is the quantitative amount of suck that exists in the world, and it's up to nerds to use the power of our awesome defeat to defeat world suck. But there's a large amount of world suck, so we're not going to be able to hit every issue. And right now, our bandwidth, uh, given that we, we have to also attend to the current uh, wishes of our base, for instance, book drives, and those kinds of things, like, that takes up a lot of time. So there is a bandwidth issue. However, it's still an interesting question. You know, first of all, I don't know this particular case. I am well aware of police brutality being a major issue. I would like to, so let me take, let me walk away from this particular case for a second and talk about police brutality specifically to people of color. Let's have a larger conversation around how we can incorporate that. I do think our members will care about it. I can, we don't have time, but I can make connections in Harry Potter, definitely in Hunger Games, around the use of police brutality uh, and, and around segregated communities based on race. Um, I can't deny that there's a lot of white people in this community and that they're coming to this with a certain sense of privilege and some ignorance. Um, we're trying. Uh, we're going to need your help. So we're open. That, that's the best I can do. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would add that I think this is bound up with the question of how we bridge between different kinds of pop culture communities mm -hmm. that I was alluding to earlier. Because if Andrew, with a mostly white organization, comes charging in to deal with right. police violence on African Americans in cities, he very much will be in a white savior complex space unless there's real collaboration with fans of color, of fans who are mobilizing around other, other forms of popular popular culture. It's got to be, we, we've got to integrate our organizations in order to integrate our political movements well, if you, we're going to actually be with any credibility deal with the kinds of issues that you're, that you're raising there. And, and so it's a chicken and egg problem. Do they tackle those issues first and then hope that that draws more people of color into the organization or do we focus on building an infrastructure where there's dialogue across racial divides and, and class divides to allow some of the stuff to work more effectively as we move forward. The key thing is we can't afford to ignore it. We have to confront it. But it's not as if there's a simple, easy answer for how we work through those divides. I mean, what, what I will say about these kinds of issues in particular, you know, there's, there's been kind of a, a legacy process that, that we're looking at that we can trace back to the Gina 6, going back to 2006. Uh, more immediately, Troy, Troy, Troy Davis, um, who was executed by the state in October of 2011, and then Trayvon Martin. And, and what we've seen is that, it, particularly in terms of what we'll just call black Twitter for the moment, is that the lessons that were kind of learned in the kind of networks that were built around first Gina 6 and then uh, Troy Davis were the things that were immediately engaged around Trayvon Martin. And the, the reason why the kind of social media activism around Trayvon Martin was so successful is because these kind of participatory communities had begun to link together before that period of time. The fact that we could have a question about um, the young man in Brooklyn at this moment, you know, at this conference speaks to the fact that there's an infrastructure that's being built. Um, it, from my purview, I have yet to see black Twitter really engage this particular issue, Kamani Gray, to the extent we've seen Trayvon Martin, but of course it's just been a week. That, that might look differently a month from now, right, as stories begin to be written about this and folks have to actually get their hands dirty around situation. And then for the Harry Potter Alliance, that's a different context for them to think about being engaged as it would be for any other group that would be interested in crossing lines, if you will, you know, to engage in this particular act of brutality. Yeah, and, and structurally, I, I, I want to find out what groups we can, what fan right. activist groups, like uh, Race Benders is an example of a group that we're bringing together, hopefully, in this larger coalition with an Imagine Better. But I'd like to go to 
uh, to go even further than that. And I mean, we're building a movement. This is this is taking time. Uh, this is very imperfect. And there's another element that I want to add to this, which is uh, this particular act of injustice and tragedy and murder, for all intents and purposes, it sounds like. Um, as activists, we need to deal with the fact that things can get horrible. And how do we, there's that phrase, don't mourn, mobilize. Uh, I just want to throw out another element to this, which is that we need to mobilize, but we also need to mourn. And how do we hold grief? Because I hear this and I feel all of a sudden like, oh God, not another, not another. Like, just, it's just horrifying. And it builds this compassion fatigue. And, 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 and uh, stories can help us with that as well. So that's another element here for helping that. But this is, this is a question, it's like an open source question because there's no answer yet and we need to build it. So thank you for the question. All right, Sasha. Hey, so uh, I'm a huge fan of all of your work and thank you so much for this, uh, this conversation, this plenary, it was amazing. Um, I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering is uh, in, in addition to thinking about how we can leverage uh, mass culture, right, and fan communities that are built around uh, uh, mass cultural products, how can we also think about uh, focusing on and amplifying and lifting up cultural workers and producers and artists who actually are already doing work that's deeply linked to social movement work? And so, for example, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about you know, Lupe Fiasco or The Coup uh, or Low Key, these are all, you know, hip hop artists who've been talking about, um, um, you know, the prison industrial complex, the murder of uh, young uh, people of color, et cetera. Um, you know, people often sort of ask this question, how come we don't have sort of mega stars and pop cultural icons now who are clearly and directly uh, and visibly linked to the social movements that are happening today. And I'd wonder, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about that strategy um, in addition to the strategy of remixing and reworking fan communities around non-explicitly politicized uh, mass cultural uh, products. The name that I me will immediately throw out is Yusiri X, right. um, who really is kind of a, a star of, of the broadband era around this regard. He's a Pittsburgh-based rapper um, who first got on the map um, collaborating with Paradise Gray, who was an original member of the 1980s hip-hop group X-Clan, um, to start shooting videos um, around their rap songs. They weren't interested in radio play. They weren't interested in a record deal. So he began to make this series of videos, first dealing with Gina Six, um, everything from Trayvon Martin to the Wisconsin uh, public workers protests, you know, which was an important kind of moment because this is this moment where hip hop gets out of its kind of own comfort zone around black political issues and crosses over to a more mainstream movement in terms of what were largely white public workers in Wisconsin pushing back against, you know, the erosion of their rights as workers. And so those elements are there. I think the models that we've used in the past where we wanted to have kind of a Harry Belafonte figure as one example of that, right, who would be this huge cultural figure that would weigh in. I think we have a generation of artists, and for very good reasons, that are less than willing to go out on the limb in that way. Um, you know, even, you know, the same way that we could hear Jay-Z, for instance, close ranks around the presidents around same-sex mar marriage, which was an extraordinary moment, right, in May of, of 2012. Um, we're probably not gonna hear Jay-Z talk anything about Kamani Carter, because that's not uh, Kamani Gray, because that's not the kind of thing that the president is going to speak of, right? And so we have to look in different spaces for where artists are willing to weigh in that regard. Lupe is a great example of that. Uh, Jasiri X is another example, right? We have folks here in Chicago um, who've been doing that kind of work, right, trying to bridge the gap with TJ Carter, TJ, um, Carter, right, <laughs> was here yesterday um, talking about what that looks like in terms of Chicago on the ground politics and the work that he's doing with Kathy Cohen. Um, so those examples are there. I don't think we can look to the old models uh, of the Hollywood stars or, or the major record stars weighing in until it's very safe for them to weigh in. So unfortunately, I just got the, cl the time's up s signal. So can we get a TARDIS? Yeah, yeah a, a, t a time turner might be useful to continue this rich discussion uh, and allow us to continue. But we hope that throughout the rest of the day, uh, I think we'll be around, eager to talk to people. 
I hope you'll talk among yourselves that we've raised some tough issues here and some great opportunities. Um, Manuel Castell talks about this as a moment of hope and outrage, and I think both of them are present in what we talked about here today. So I want us to carry out in the rest of the day that both the hope and the outrage and talk among ourselves. <laughs> can, can we also, I just... Andrew, Let's we see. have to, we do, our, our, our time is an issue here. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. So, so the, there will be opportunities to obviously connect and, and speak with them. Um, the, the Twitter conversation about this, the back channel has been incredible, right. Uh, right. Just really active, uh, robust. Um, can we just uh, give uh, our plenaries a, a round of applause? <laughs> thank you. And we have one really quick announcement uh, before we leave that we wanted to share with you. It's about an opportunity that a lot of you will, will want to hear about. So we'll do that right quickly before we uh, transition. Thank you, David. Um, this is an invitation. I'm Sarah Lukes with Next Generation Learning Challenges, and we are announcing $12 million in new grants. Uh, we call it Wave 4 for Breakthrough Schools. If you go to nextgenlearning.org forward slash breakthrough hyphen um, grant, <laughs> you'll see all the information you need to know. But here's the really important thing. This is a much broader invitation than we've ever released before. So it is open to nonprofits, institutions of higher ed, um, certainly traditional schools, charter organizations, but a, a much broader audience. And I have um, never heard so many fantastic ideas about what learning could be for students. So I hope you will check it out. I hope you will contact me. I'm the program officer for this particular wave um, with your ideas. The planning grant, of which we will issue 30, is $100,000. You essentially have to write a five to seven page essay about your fantastic idea. <laughs> and the first deadline is April 22nd. It happens in two cycles. So if you don't hit the April 22nd deadline, you could come back at it December 2nd of this year. There's also 20 grants for $450,000, and that also is done in two cycles. So we'll award approximately 10 in the first cycle to open a brand new school this fall, if you're so positioned. Um, that also, April 22nd, and again, another round of 10, December 2nd. So thank you very much. Uh, please contact me. Yep. Let me make sure I get it right. Uh, next gen learning altogether.org forward slash breakthrough hyphen grants. And I'll put it in the listserv and whatnot too, so you have it there. And I'm S. Lukes, L U C H S, at educause.edu. Thank you. And we'll also try to put this on the, the, the Twitter for, for DML so you'll have access to it that way as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs>